5859. The Palometta Masonic Lodges Car Show, Saturday, June 22nd, 10 a.m. to 4 p.m., 504 Park Street, Palometta, Georgia. Cars, trucks, motorcycles, family fun, food, and more. Boston Butts for sale, 770-316-3244. Coweta Forces, connecting Coweta recovery support groups nightly and daily at 36 South Beatty Avenue in Noonan, 678-340-5822. Prison 2 Power Incorporate presents Save Our Youth, Become a Mentor. Students with a mentor has 52% less likely than their peers to skip school. 821-704-3388 www.prisontopower.org and Noonan City Church 17 First Avenue here in the metro Atlanta area of Noonan asking you to join us for one of our four services Sunday mornings 8 a.m. inside services 9 a.m. and 10.30 service outside under the tent cool hip kids in CCPM 6.30 p.m. Yes, 17 First Avenue, Pastor Jimmy Ellison invites you out. That's your WQEE 99.1 FM Community Calendar. WQEE 99.1 FM, The Key, Noonan, Sharpsburg, Franklin, LaGray. Hey, hon, what you doing with your phone? Taking pictures? No, I'm asking questions. Like what? Hey, Bobo, do flowers have best friends? I'm sorry, I'm afraid I don't know that. Hey, follow me. I want to show you something. Look, flowers do have best friends. Whoa. Some answers can only be found in nature. Discover the unsearchable. Visit discovertheforest.org to find a trail near you. Brought to you by the United States Forest Service and the Ad Council. The views and opinions of this show and program are not the views and opinions of this station, its management, or its clientele. Welcome into Health, Happiness, and Harmony Hour with Dr. Louis Boynte. Your session has been booked It's now time for you to tune in here and get positive vibes, great information, and much more. Here is your host, Dr. Lewis Boynton. Good morning, and thanks for joining us here at Health, Happiness, and Harmony. I'm Dr. Lewis Point, and I'm your host today. Health, Happiness, and Harmony is a show in which we talk about positive psychology, and today we're actually going to talk about the theory of positive psychology. And um, many of you may not have heard about this, but it was started around 2004, 2005 by a gentleman named Martin Seligman. And if you want to look him up on YouTube or Google him, he's a pretty interesting guy. He actually invented the theory of learned helplessness, which was used in um, many of the uh, CIA torture programs. The goal was to get people to a state of learned helplessness, which is interesting because he had kind of like a midlife crisis, you know. He um, went from being a cognitive behavioral guy to all of a sudden thinking like, hey, uh, all we talk about is like the bad stuff and we mostly do our studies on negative stuff about psychology and it's like why are we only focused on the negative stuff although we missed a big giant part of science called humanistic psychology and a lot of their work he kind of avoided um, and borrowed from um, <laughs> but uh, But he did discover this idea of, like, why don't we look at what are the qualities that humans have that help them to be happy in life, to find what he called a sense of authentic happiness. And he wrote a book called Authentic Happiness around 2005. It came out, mostly psychologists read it. Um, I'm not sure if a lot of people looked at it, but he had an interesting theory. He said, if if we can discover what our sort of best, like, signature strengths, he called them, are, and the kind of things that are positive, the positive practices we can use, then we can use that to develop our whole life. We can create a plan. Um, We can figure out what are our characteristics, what are our strengths, what are our positive qualities, and we can match those to kind of like a 
job or something or a way to motivate ourselves through life, a way to make ourselves find what, what he called true happiness, which is like a practice of happiness. It's not necessarily happiness on tap. You know what I mean? Like if you have enough money, you can buy whatever you want or need and, oh, I'm happy for a second. But it's more like a sense of purpose and meaning in life. Um, very close to what Maslow called an um, actualization. And an actualization is a momentary sort of thing in which you find yourself complete as a human. It's a very interesting kind of a quality. It's where you feel like life is okay, you're safe, and you can move forward. It's hard to find nowadays because we're skipping from one thing to the next 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 thing to looking up something to go to something else to look at something else to go to something else to text to chat to tweet to call to text to chat to tweet to I am to whatever you want to call it but you know often we're not in tune and focused on what we're doing personally in our life you know last time we talked a little bit about the four agreements last time I was here and you know that's kind of paying attention to what you do and developing yourself as a human being to be better to mean what you say and say what you mean, to not make assumptions and to not take things so personally. Virtues are kind of the, the underlying foundation of that, to how you develop the structure of your own identity in a positive way. Seligman and his, uh, I guess, team of researchers um, read through about 200 or so works of different uh, myths and histories Throughout time, they went through the Bible, the Iliad, the, you know, the, the Odyssey, the, the great books, the great plays of different kind of cultures and religions. They went through a lot of stuff by um, Joseph Campbell, who's sort of a mythologist who studied all these myths and legends and things. And they discovered that there were primarily six different virtues that they called ubiquitous virtues. And within those virtues, which honestly, I think there are little other mini virtues, but Within those virtues are different kind of qualities or strengths that each person has to, has to have to practice those virtues. And that was an interesting theory because primarily most people, most religions and myths and sort of um, ways to explain to humans who are kind of illiterate what virtues were, were done through parables, metaphors, and stories, you know? So it would be... Very much so, like, uh, I don't know if anyone remembers this when they were kids. They had these Aesop's fables, which are like parables about morality. And then, of course, for spiritual people, it's the spiritual texts that you read and focus on. They help you to understand what virtues are, like what is wisdom? What is courage? How can you practice humility? Why should you fight for justice? One of the most important ones that is getting harder and harder to practice. It's called temperance. And then finally, the, the, the final one is transcendent. It's the feeling of going beyond who you are and what you are. Those are some of the things that he found out. Although uh, later on uh, at the University of Chicago, in Illinois, they developed the Virtue Society, and they came up with 44 virtues that humans practice, 44 things that we do that are good for us. Some of those virtues are listed in, in what Seligman would call a signature strength. I think he did that because he felt like there were giant, broad categories, and within each category were certain practices you had to have to, to gain that certain quality, you know? Like if you think about wisdom, right? Wisdom, most of us don't even talk about wisdom anymore because we just use our phone for all our wisdom, right? Why would you have to have knowledge, carry knowledge, if you've got it in your pocket, you know? Mm -hmm. Why would you want to think if your brain is coming with you everywhere and it can be looked up instantly? So the reason why is because let's just go back to Socrates, okay? <laughs> okay. For those of you who don't know who Socrates is, he was in a Bill and Ted movie. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> He was in Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventures. <laughs> and they called them Socrates. <laughs> party on, Bill. That was just for the millennials, for X generations and below. 
<laughs> remember. No, Socrates was a famous philosopher, probably one of the greatest unknown figures in the world because Socrates was only written about by Plato. And we don't know if Socrates was a real figure or if it was like Plato's imagination just creating this sort of fictional character to exemplify morals and spiritual quest for, for wisdom. And Socrates was the great sort of philosopher discuss what wisdom was. And what he said was that wisdom is knowing what you do not know. Ooh, pretty humble and pretty wise. <laughs> but, but Socrates' goal was to enhance people's intellect through a series of questioning that challenged what they held inside their brain. I know that sounds unfamiliar now because we don't hold a lot of information in our brain except for which is the best app to use to find directions, which is the best music app, and, you know, my favorite shows on Netflix, you know, Hulu, you know, Max, sorry, I was going to say HBO Max, but it's Max, Showtime, whatever. You know, we don't hold as much information as we used to, but back in his time, people barely knew how to read textbooks were not readily available so most of the sort of information you had to hold and carry with you and you would base like your answers to these great Socratic questions on what you knew and I was uh, reading a little bit about him and his history you know like his pursuit of wisdom you know he actually died for his pursuit of wisdom he died for his criticism of the political system for criticizing the people around him and for provoking people to question their world you know i mean it sounds like he would be the the most popular blogger on youtube right now if he was alive because he would provoke people to ask and seek out the deep questions what i didn't realize is that he was on an actual spiritual pursuit and he considered wisdom as kind of a spiritual practice that sounds interesting but also, like, we don't think about wisdom and gaining information as a spiritual practice. We think about it as a tool. Another thing I discovered while doing research is that a lot of our dialogue and the way we talk about things, once again, is in a way to prove that we're right. This origin comes actually from the Greeks. The Greeks, yes, the Greeks studied this idea of argumentation using rhetoric and dialogue to Get your point across to prove that you're right, to show and demonstrate the argument's strength. And it's sort of how we talk to each other today. You know, um, wisdom used to be considered a, a trait that was admirable, you know, to be wise, to, to know information, to understand, to find out, you know, things that are different in the world, to research things, to look for things. Wisdom used to be a consider, considered a high advantage sort of trait to have, a virtue to practice. Seligman looked at wisdom in a, in a way in which we sort of, he broke it down into different categories, and he said, these are the qualities of people who are really wise, who, who like to pursue the idea of wisdom, and, and the first one is creativity. He said, in order to be wise, we have to have a little bit of creativity, a little originality, the ability to be adaptive and ingenuity, the idea to come up with something new, you know, if we think about it, it's, there are so many new things out there coming out every day and so many creative ways that people are making money. This practice is still very, very alive in, in the human race. We use it to come up with original ideas, to come up with original com to even come up with things in which we think are going to be good for the world. Think about the electric vehicle. You know, that was sort of an ingenuitive project, you know, saying, hey, if we use electricity instead of gas, it might be better for the environment. You know, think about the solar panel. Think about the, the large wind turbines that we have out there. Although people will complain saying they make pollution and they cause damage and all these other things. But, you know, clean, clean energy is an original adaptive, ingenuitive idea. There are also certain things out there that's, that are also partially unknown, you know? But it's the idea that we can create new things just by imagining them. 
that's part of you know what wisdom is. Another thing that I think is the most important thing is curiosity. It did kill the cat, but curiosity in the world around you to come up with new things and interest in what's going on. Not necessarily just only political, but in the things around you, you know? What's going on that's good in my world? Sometimes we have this narrow, narrow, narrow focus on the bad stuff. It's like, why don't I see what is the good stuff going on? You know, when they talk about global warming and stuff, they don't say, well, here's a new invention that's going to help us with global warming. Like, we literally have factories out there that can pull carbon from the atmosphere, put it below, freeze it, and stuff it in caves. We have soil that is carbon absorbent soil. We have kelp farms that we can plant out in the oceans that will help to absorb mega, mega amounts of carbon from the environment. We just don't talk about it as much, you know? We have kelp farms that also kelp is food. Believe it or not, you can make kelp bars and eat them. They don't taste so good, but they will keep you alive. You can also grow oysters in kelp farms, which is something I personally approve of more oysters in the world. I think so. I think we need more oysters, but curiosity gives you interest. It looks to explore the world and see what's going on, but it also makes you be open to new ideas, right? So sometimes, you know, we get scared. We get anxious about the world around us. We don't want to become open to new ideas. We want to close them down. We think, other people are wrong, so we don't want to listen to their opinions. More and more nowadays, people feel like, you know, I don't want to talk to you because you're just going to discount me anyway. You're not going to believe what I say. You're not going to think that I'm equal to you because I have a different idea than you. And so I'm just not going to listen to you, and I'm actually not going to like you even before I talk to you because you're one of those people. And that's just not a great way to live in the world. It makes it very scary. It makes it very hard to trust the people around you. And, and it, I, honestly, I felt as though there was a time in the world that, that we didn't live like that. We didn't think about the other person as being against me just because they have a different way of seeing the world than me. That, that just was never true. It doesn't, and there's no evidence to say that if somebody believes something different than you, that means that they're hostile to you. It's not the truth. It just means that people who believe different than you believe something different than you. And that's it, you know? And it's allowed in America, right? Isn't it? It's, mm -hmm. it's still allowed. It's all free of speech. Yeah. yeah, it's allowed. So it's okay. And it's not violent. It's just an idea. Right. You know? Not all ideas are violent. Not all ideas are created to cause you harm, to cause you fear, to cause you anxiety. Ideas are just ideas. They're out there floating around. And people's minds can be changed. People's hearts can be changed. People can become open to situations and say, hey, you know what? I was wrong. I used to believe in this one thing. And it was like, I thought it was really cool and it was great and all this other stuff. But you know what? When I looked at all the stuff and I read about all the evidence and everything and I, and I looked at it, and I figured out, like, the truth and stuff. It was different than what I thought. And I was wrong. And that's okay. Because you know what I learned? Sometimes I could be wrong. I mean, that's about it. It doesn't hurt. It doesn't break you. It doesn't make you disloyal to anybody. It doesn't take you away and out of your group. It just makes you different and think different. And it's okay to think different. And that's part of being curious about the world. You could change your mind. I've had several opinions of mine changed because, you know, I was just wrong. And it doesn't matter how smart you are or how tall you are or how rich you are or how many friends you have. Sometimes the things you think can be wrong and can actually hurt people around you. Um, that happens all the time in life. But one of the good things about having wisdom is you can learn from that. You could change your mind. Believe it or not, it's okay. Judgment is another quality of wisdom. Being able to think critically, thinking through things and having open an open mind. This is a term that is not said as much as we used to say it, although, you know, it's seen as kind of a liberal attack if you say be open-minded. 
but it's not really. It's just an I. It's an. It's a way of looking at the world in which you can understand what other people are talking about and try to understand what they're saying and understand where they're coming from. You know, I know wisdom is thought of as a thing that is not necessarily a practice, but it really is a practice. You know, we've got to practice learning new things. We've got to practice understanding our limits in the world. We've got to practice sort of finding ways to re-examine ourselves. Nietzsche, who was like a Frederick Nietzsche, who was like a big time philosopher, kind of made a lot of religious people mad by things that he said. But also he did say that we should challenge the way we see the world and think about things. He said this really intense quote. He said, be at war with yourself at all times. But really what he was saying is we should re-envision the world. We shouldn't be satisfied with the way things are appearing to us. We should look and investigate and, and learn new things and see new things about the world. No matter what stage in life we are, because there's always new changing things, you know. I love the idea of critical thinking, although we have kind of homogenized what it is. Critical thinking is really being able to examine big, 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 big ideas. Like, I don't know, maybe I should talk about this one. Let's examine the whole QAnon thing, okay? <laughs> Let's just think through it, okay? It, is it? Is it really likely that, you know, there are kind of lizard people running the government? Or maybe not. I don't know. You know? <laughs> Sorry. But is it likely that this is true? Is it likely that these conspiracy theories are true? Or is it likely that they just make you feel as though it gives you a great, great, great way to feel anxious about the world and continue a path of thinking you're already on? Think through that, you know? I mean, are, do these things make sense for you? And if they do, that's fine. You're, you're able to hold on to those. That's the cool thing about America, right? First Amendment rights. But if not, it's okay to say, you know what? Maybe I was wrong about that. Maybe I jumped to a conclusion. Maybe I, you know, maybe I was scared and fearful about the world around me. And maybe I jumped to a conclusion because I really, really wanted to believe in something that made me get an answer. Okay. Part of wisdom is being open to new answers. Part of wisdom is being open to critical thinking is really examining something for its whole validity. Is it reliable? You know? Is the internet completely 100% reliable with all the information on it? 100% reliable. <laughs> Does every person who posts tell the truth? is a question you've got to ask yourself because I don't think they do sometimes. Honestly, from all the stuff, I, I, I spend less time on the internet, but sometimes I'll go on there and go, that doesn't sound like it's true, you know? When I came up, we didn't have the internet, but we had these magazines called The Inquirer, The Globe, you know? Mad, mad, yeah, mad magazine. We had these magazines that would be like, they would have these big stories like movie star impregnated by an alien for a one night stand. And you would and you would go kind of, you know, that sounds kind of. I saw Michael Jackson was invented. That, that, kind of, that sounds kind of like it's not true, but it's kind of sensational. So I might want to read the story. So I'll buy it and read the story as like entertainment, not as real. You know, and it seems like now the lines between entertainment and like storytelling have kind of merged, you know, so where it's like some of the stories become like news events, but they're really just stories. And that's why critical thinking can help you. It's just really a practice of examining it and saying, is there really proof that this is true? And if it's cited from another web post, that's not may not be the, the necessary truth. But I mean, who knows? It could be true. But critical thinking just means you examine it, you know, and you think things through and you're open to the possibility of changes. If you get on somewhere and you're like, oh, my God, I've been thinking that for five years and this site is so good and I believe everything they say and this is going to be OK. That means that you have been influenced, right? It also means that you're probably making and drawing conclusions and 
making assumptions based on your own set of beliefs in the world. Nothing wrong with that because it's usually what humans do, but there's also a way where you can undo that and say, hey, look, is this real? Or is this my own sort of bias that I'm projecting onto this? And, you know, and take a look at your news feed. And, you know, there, there's this cool um, sort of show they did on Netflix, and it was about, you know, the influence of social media. But one of the things that they suggested is you look at other people's news feeds to actually see what's going on. Because really, if we were all getting the same information, everybody's news feed would look the same. Do you understand that? Like, we're getting fed information based on our searches, which to me feels a little bit like I'm being manipulated, you know? Because if I search, like, diaper cream one day and diapers, then all of a sudden I got all these posts about being a dad and having new babies and all this stuff. It makes me feel like I'm being influenced, you know, by what I'm looking up on the Internet. And I don't know if that's right or wrong, but it just means I need to be aware of that, right? I need to be aware that... I'm being influenced all the time. And I know everybody's heard this over and over again, but you know what? Part of wisdom is reminding yourself that there are things out there that are going to influence the way I see the world, the way I think about things. The way I talk to other people, the way I do my searches on the Internet, the way I get friends in society is all going to be influenced by stuff around me in my world. So if I want to think through and be critical and understand, it'll give me better judgment in the world, you know? People say I've got good common sense, but sometimes your common sense is being influenced, you know? It's influenced by fear, anxiety, your position in the world, whether you're financially secure or not. A lot of those things, a lot of people don't spend the time to do stuff because they're so busy working and just basically surviving, just getting by, you know? Put your head down, keep going, do those things in life that get you through the next day, through the next day, through the next day, through the next day, through the next day. And they get you to a place where sometimes you don't feel so good about your life and sometimes you get mad and worried and whatever. And then you get your opinion set and then, you know, you're living a life that maybe not be, might not be so pleasant. So the reason why we have wisdom is to open up our eyes, open up our mind to be available to things. Uh, another thing he put in the category of wisdom as far as a strength is love of learning. This is something that I really like uh, I really like to do for myself. I like to master new skills and understand new topics. This is something not for everyone, but, but if you do like to learn, one of the essential qualities that I was talking to about a friend of mine who's a professor is um, spending time reading. I know it's not a good thing to say out loud because most people are like, I read all the time on the internet, man. I read, I read, I read all the time. But I'm talking about like maybe books and, and articles and things like that just to keep you informed about the world. Getting interested in something new for yourself, maybe even new hobbies, new ideas about the world, new ways to see the world and connect with your friends. Um, you know, he also says systematically adding knowledge to knowledge. That just means being curious enough to learn new things as you go along. So when I was going to school, I, I learned a bunch of stuff, and I, I guess that trait just stayed with me, but I still become fascinated with things and learn as much as I can about them. For instance, I was really into this idea of immersive experiences, and this is a sort of a simulation of real life and some fantasy projected onto walls inside a room. We have several museums like that. Now we have people doing like spaces and restaurants and spas and all this stuff. But I thought it'd be a really unique experience for doing it in therapy. So I, I researched all the information about it. I contacted companies. I contacted researchers like all over the world. And I discovered this awesome new technology that in about five years is going to be used to change, literally change the way we live. And it's just so new that not everybody's looked into it. So I'm waiting and writing right now, gaining information. But because of my interest in it, I got to grasp a whole bunch of in information. And it turns out a lot of the stuff I've been doing with like filmmaking and recording and sound recording and stuff, is going to help me to gain and add to my own personal information. So 
for me, it's kind of a challenge, and it keeps me moving forward and gives me something to look forward to, and that's what learning does for you. I know there's a lot of bad stuff about, you know, colleges are too liberal, and learning is for the elites, and, you know, you can learn anything from your phone, basically, but, you know, there's something about being challenged in an environment where they push you to do better, um, just to say it out loud, and for me, I went back to sc- I went to school when I was young, but then I went back to school as an older person, and I think maybe the way we do education needs to change. I mean, maybe we need people to go back when they're older and can appreciate it more. Maybe we need people to wait until their brain is kind of fully developed. But when I went back as an older student, I cherished the information I got. I used the money that I spent. I I put invested into it as well with my time and studying and effort so that I came out with an education that I cherished and was valuable to me, an education that I could continue for the rest of my life. And we talk about that a lot. If you ever go to college, you'll hear it a lot, lifetime learner, lifetime learner, lifetime learner. But I don't think there's anything wrong about being a lifetime learner. And most people, whether they've had a college education or not, spend their life learning lessons, you know? Good ones, bad ones, difficult ones. But we all learn throughout our lifetime. Finally, he says perspective. And he talks about um, proving to be a wise counselor. He uses the word wisdom, and he says taking the big picture view. This is something that, you know, is perspective is one of the harder facets to wisdom, you know, to understand things in a big view, like the global aspect of something or the community aspect of something or the corporate wide vision of something. These are the things that people, you know, do when they're in the uh, in the learning phase, in the perspective phase, when they have deep ideas of searching, also when they're inspired and have a meaningful sort of way about them, like they're looking to make people invest into something or looking to raise money for something, they can have that big view, you know, and big ideas, you know. If you think about it, when is the last big idea that you've had and how did you actually pursue it, you know? When did you kind of think about, hey, this is going to be a great idea for the future, and I think I can do something to make it happen, you know? That's what it means to have, like, the big view picture, like seeing it all, you know, from beginning to end. It's, it's a very cool place to be. When you have it, it's very inspiring and meaningful. The hard part is to enact it, you know? It's, it's great to have a head full of knowledge. The next part is, you know, the other parts of virtues and, you know, that's, those are the cat, those are like the strengths within wisdom. So he says wisdom is a virtue, but to have wisdom, you have to have creativity, curiosity, judgment, love of learning and perspective. These are the things that he feels like, these are the qualities of everybody who has sort of a strength of wisdom, you know? And I think what Seligman's saying is that not everybody has equal parts to all of these kind of virtues. You know, he doesn't he doesn't say it like that. He says they're all practices. And he says everybody has, has a unique sort of combination of all of these qualities. And because of their life and their experience, they practice them in different ways. Like say somebody's got a big, you know, family who pushes education, is is financially stable, they they they, they show their, their kids love and support. They push them towards stuff. And, and also, it could be another family that's very strict and very, you know, concerned with you going to college and put you on the right track and micromanage your whole life. Very different ways to attain wisdom, but these are some of the qualities he noticed in people that he considers wise. And also, he drew the strengths, remember, from writings. Like, when people explain about wisdom... They will use writings from Socrates. You know, Socrates had many, many dialogues in which he just debated and discussed things like ethics, rhetoric, the virtues of a man, the qualities of what things are, you know, within his dialogues. And if you read them, you'll understand more and more about 
how the Greeks taught their people who were primarily illiterate through reading and plays and things, the, the ideals of wisdom. They also taught another virtue, which is called courage. Courage is quite often uh, seen as a uh, connected with a with violence and war and battle. You know, courage is seen as being a, a thing that's mostly connected with soldiers and warriors and heroes and all those things. But courage can also be seen in people who are not so violent, people who are more uh, uh, apt to find things like kindness and compassion and, and other things. Courage can be displayed in ways that are nonviolent completely. And as a matter of fact, when you look back on our American history of the nonviolent uh, sort of protest movement, it takes a lot of courage to walk up to somebody and say, hey, I'm not going to hit you back, but it's okay if you're going to hit me. You know what I mean? It's something that Gandhi started. Martin Luther King did for a long time, and the idea was that it, it takes courage, and once you put yourself out there for people... Once you show them that you have the courage to stand up for what you believe is right, eventually they're going to see that the thing that they're mad at you for or beating you up for is not as right as they thought it was, you know, because it's causing them to do violence. And that's, that's the idea behind the nonviolent movement. It was that love is greater than hate. And then eventually, if I show you the courage of my love and belief system, you're going to understand me and see me and believe that I'm a person just like you. And you're going to see my courage just from my uh, courageous stand in my moral belief, you know? And the moral belief is that all people are equal. I mean, I know that's a little controversial nowadays. <laughs> I don't want to get into that topic, but... I don't know why all people is equal is controversial, but it is, you know, all well, groups. Right. Yeah, yeah. Even them people, you know, them peoples. Even them peoples are equals. You know what I mean? Wow. Yeah. But it takes courage to get up get to the point where you can say, you know what, maybe they're right. Maybe they are people like me. Maybe they have two legs and two arms and two eyes, mouth, nose and ears and stuff, and a brain, just like me. Maybe. But the courage there is is incredible and like i said it's associated kind of with being courageous and fighting in battle and not running away and you know not doing things that are against your morals and all that stuff but courage is a courage and a stance in your conviction now seligman says bravery perseverance honesty and zest those are the qualities or the signature strengths within courage and within bravery that's more what we think of you know as courage all the time it's more like bravery but not shrinking from fear, speaking up for what's right, and this idea of valor, which is strength under impossible conditions, you know? Finding that stuff is all bravery. That's really incredibly important as far as courage and important when you're sticking up for stuff you believe in, you know? Standing to, to your belief system, holding, holding your own, and being able to prepare an argument that will convince others that what you're doing is kind of right, if that's what you believe in, or at least being able to express what you believe in out loud in a decent argument. Perseverance is persistence and finishing what you start. Now, this is something where I think some of our movements, because of the internet, get a little bit shaky on, you know what I mean? Something's like a huge issue for like two weeks, and then it's like, boop, gone. Something's like a big issue for like two weeks, and then it's like, boop, just gone, <laughs> you know? And there may be thousands of people working on it, but it just feels like it gets a lot of attention in the news, and it feels like it's really popular. I, I think we have some of that in the news lately, you know? It's like things get really popular in the news and people are like, we're going to go protest, you know? I, you know, have you noticed lately there's this war going on in Israel and stuff and there's like all these protests coming up? It's like protests here, protests there, protests here, protests there. And then it kind of kind of fades out over time. It, it, it seems like it's the perseverance is the hardest part of courage is to, to stick in there and stay I used to do a lot of writing on social justice and social justice psychology. It's a huge movement now, but when I started writing on it, 
it was seen as like an outlier uh, critical movement that was kind of controversial in academia. And now it's like kind of pro-academic um, sort of um, political stance. You know, it's like we need justice for everyone, but it seems like it's hard to do that when your dialogue and rhetoric is kind of impossible to understand or it's not designed for people who who need to understand it if you know what i mean so it's hard to figure out how to have that like perseverance in a movement when you're just speaking at someone who feels like they're being you know talked down to or condescended you know it, it just is harder to do that it used to be that in our movements we tried to make people understand um, one of the great sort of readings that I read was Pedagogy of the Oppressed, which is written by Pablo Freire. Great book. And written by an, a Latin scholar. And what he was talking about is like, how do we get people to understand that the stuff they're doing is killing us and hurting us? You know, and he said, you know, it's the, it's the people who are oppressed who educate the oppressor. It's the people who persevere and commit to a project and keep going time and time again pushing through I, I know it's very hard to hear if you've been doing something for a very long time and you don't see any results you get kind of mad and frustrated but the perseverance is kind of the key to change um, the greatest kind of change movements in the u.s we don't even talk about them anymore but mothers against drunk driving and the uh, secondary smoke movement two of the greatest movements in the u.s that made lasting change. I don't know if you noticed, but you can't really smoke in bars anymore, right? And that was changed by the secondary smoke movement. And I don't know if you don't notice, but a lot of people get in a lot of trouble for driving drunk, you know? So less people drive drunk. The Mothers Against Drunk Driving movement made those changes, passed national, federal legislation, helped to set laws and rules mainly through their perseverance. You know, the Mothers Against Drunk Driving movement was started by moms who had lost children to drunken driving accidents. And they were so upset, they made an organization and changed the legislation. You know, that's one of the last times that stuff happened in such a big way that it's impacted all of us. And then the secondary smoke movement, they went and got research and scientists and they presented it and they discovered that, yes, secondary smoke does cause health effects to other people. When I grew up, everybody smoked on trains. Everybody smoked on planes. Bars were literally filled with smoke. Even people who were in recovery, AA meetings and stuff like that, had lots of people smoking cigarettes. And all of that has changed over time because of the persistence of the movement um, he says to have courage you have to have honesty what I can't be courageous and dishonest can't be right. that can't be right that sounds like I need to post on the internet about that now <laughs> he says under the honesty we need to have authenticity which is being who you're supposed to be not a character not a cardboard cutout not an Instagram model, not a pit, big old Instagram personality that you created, that you made up, but be who you are is part of being courageous, authenticity. You know what? It'd be amazing if we had a ton of authentic internet sites that just said, hey, I'm going to be who I are. I don't know if they've had many followers, you know, because most people, you know, they're not that exciting, but some people may be. Another thing he says is integrity. This is simply doing what you say you're going to do. Knowing who you are and your limits. We talked about it last show I did, uh, you know, about in the uh, four agreements where it's like, do what you say you're going to do. Be a person of honor, you know. Try to meet what you say you're going to be. I know it's, it's nice to please everybody all the time, but it's really hard to make all the commitments you promised all the time. This last one, I don't know why he put it under courage, but I guess it's true. He says it's zest, vitality, which is the idea of feeling alive, feeling connected, feeling enthusiasm, feeling energy, feeling like you can connect with other people and make a difference. And that's where if you have zest and all these other qualities, you could be courageous, say 
in an idea, in a movement, in your profession, in whatever you do, you can push to making yourself be a better person by exploring your own sort of virtue practices. How do you practice being courageous? Do you just keep your opinions to yourself? Do you hide out? Do you don't speak to what you believe? Do you not investigate things? Do you look through things? Do you just believe one thing and just hold on to it as hard as you can because it makes you feel safe and it makes you feel like in control? These are all things you can examine using your own courage. It gives you the ability to see who you are, to see what you stand for, and also to see if you can make changes. I personally believe we change all the time. As humans, we can't stay static just because of the nature of the world. I think I've even changed since before COVID, you know? And then during COVID, we made a lot of changes. Lots of people became, you know, less safe in the world. You know, they became more anxious about the world around them just because of the nature of COVID. You know, you don't, if you believe in COVID, you know, somebody could get you sick just by breathing on you. If you don't believe in COVID, somebody could make you mad just by telling you to get a vaccine. You know, it's just like, that's the way the world is and we all change. If we have courage enough, we can see what are the good changes? What are the changes that limit me? And then use that information to recreate who I am, to add more vitality, to understand my new enthusiasm for life, and to create more, I guess, energy. Because you don't put a lot of energy into the scared, fear, isolating stuff. You put energy into the change, moving forward, being in the world spot. And it helps you to grow as a person. And remember, well, I'm definitely not going to get to all these virtues, but remember, like, when you practice a virtue, it's sort of a positive psychological practice. And that was Seligman's idea. It's like, let's look at what are the good things that humans do, not necessarily to each other, but individually to make their lives better, you know? What do humans do individually to make their lives better? And, you know, he came up with these ideas because throughout history, we have examples of these are the things that are good qualities from humans. And we've written about them and described them in myths. And we usually assign those traits to like heroes, you know, like Hercules or Zeus or like Apollo or who's that other one? Um, Pericles, I think. Pericles and different kind of uh, mythology, mythological factors. You know, you can see them in spiritual texts, like Buddha has a ton of virtues. And Confucius talked and spoke about virtues that people had and could use to be better in politics, in philosophy, and just in life, you know? If you think about it, the practices that you do every day are kind of the things that make up your day, right? The times you go to work, the times you take a shower, the times you drink your coffee, all those things get you there, but also the way you talk to people, the people you see, the things you do every day impact and affect you in your life. So I think I'm going to be able to get to one more. This is called Humanity. He wrote, wrote Humanity, but it's really love and love for human beings. It's And within that, he has three things. Love, loving and being loved, the ability to love others and accept love. Now, I know that sounds like, yeah, I know how to do that, but it feels like, sorry, just in the world, we have less tolerance for others, you know? And it would be good if you you practice love to have more tolerance. Um, I talk a lot about compassion. I feel it's one of the most important things for us to practice every single day. But loving and being loved is not necessarily just romantic. It's about the people around you. It's about accepting others as being human and having a right to exist around you. It's about believing that people have and are important in everyday life. You know, they have important things they do and they are important in everyday life. Valuing close relationships with others is another one. Friendships. C.S. Lewis wrote a book in the 40s and said... Human friendships are kind of the least valued things and the least thing we talk about when it's related to love. And I think he's right. We don't talk about how our friends help us through life, how our friends help us keep motivated 
Our friends help us push through. Sometimes when we have hard times, we can go to our friends and just unload those sort of things. But what's happening in the world right now is more and more people find it harder to make friends. So it's something to understand that we need people in our lives, not just digital people, not just, sorry, Discord connections for all of those out there. That's a digital relationship, not necessarily a social relationship. Although you're, although everybody's on your server and everybody's pals while you're playing video games, it's, uh, it's connected through a digital means. And, and there's rules when you're with somebody in person that are different. Another thing we talk a lot about here is kindness. Being able to give and receive kindness, being nice just in general, having care and compassion for others. And there's this thing that's sort of diminishing lately. It's called altruism. It's doing the right thing just for the sake of being right, you know? Oh, boy, I'm just never going to get through this. So um, social intelligence is the awareness of your own motives and the feeling of others. Oh, my God. I think we need to take a course in this. I know I do. Um, knowing what makes other people tick. This is also thought of as empathy, being able to see in other people's experience, you know? And with love, kindness, and social intelligence, Seligman saying we're able to be more human. We're able to see the other take part in their lives and not always just push them out and hate them and be scared of them, you know? So the idea here is to practice that every single day. And I'm going to have to end right there because my time is up. And I just want to say, Seligman was really smart when he came up with these virtues, but they are not the end-all, be-all. This is just a theory. But the idea here is if you have some guidelines, you can practice new things and add to your life. And that's the goal of sort of what we talk about in the show. You know, When we're talking about positive psychology, we're trying to tell people, we're trying to tell people, you know, here's the positive things you can practice in life to make your life better and make some changes. So I'm going to leave it right there. My name is Dr. Lewis Boyne. Thanks so much for joining me here at Health, Happiness, and Harmony. And I hope you have a good day. Music therapy next week. And we will be doing music therapy next week. It'll be awesome. So I don't know what kind of show we'll do. Maybe we'll do love, love and romance or something like that. I don't know. Some folk music. Some folk, yeah, let's do some folk music. Oh, I got some good, yeah, I got some good folk music. Play some Bob. All right, everybody, have a great day, and thanks for joining us here on 99.1 WQEE, the place where we practice positive psychology.